Dear Dr. Harris, please forgive me, and this goes for whatever audience this video might attract for reading this, but I need to make this quick and coherent, and this is the fastest way of doing so. It's true. I want you to address some of the issues that I believe made our discussion both more trying and less valuable than it might have been. A problem that many of the people who now listen to it rightly identify. I think that our discussion would perhaps have been more productive if we started from the realization that we're both trying to address the same problem. That you can be what is the relationship between science and ethics? And that's not true. But you can you see ethics as nested in some scientific realism. Now, obviously, that's a contentious claim, which is not the same as it being wrong. But the fact that it's contentious, re David Hume and his problem with deriving not from an is, means that there is a real problem there. I see that scientific realism is nested inside Darwinian competition, at least potentially, not necessarily. I could be wrong, but I am trying to address the real problem. And I think the fact that you're addressing the science slash ethics problem indicates that you see that there's a real problem there too. Switch genders. Well, yeah, I also think we only got into the problems with my formulation, not the problems with your solution. For example, a problem with measuring well being. You consider the enhancement of well being a proper aim of ethics. However, the psychological measures of well being currently used are almost only trait extroversion minus trait neuroticism. That's happiness minus sadness. Well, that's how well being is currently defined. When I was at Harvard, well, that proposition is faulty in every way. It's a big problem. It's a measurement problem. It's a scientific realism problem. You might say, well, we need better measures of well-being. And I would say, well, exactly. And those will have to be nested inside the Darwinian conundrum. How should we act in the world? Here's an answer. Individually. But then all of a sudden, so that the family thrives at the family level, so that society thrives at the societal level, so that the ecosystem thrives, and not just today, tomorrow, next week, next year, and across time. That's the problem the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget was trying to address when he studied the real development of children. Piaget was interested in solving the problem of the relationship between science and ethics, and he looked how he looked at how ethics. And children emerge and transform into adults. That's what drove him his entire life. He was trying to formulate a scientific solution to the problem of ethics. And I've drawn a lot of my thinking from that. Now, I'm going to jump to a level of analysis, and when I do so, it will make many think I've gone off the rails in this argument. I ask for your indulgence while I try to put things together that have not yet been put together. This means that I have to present many ideas simultaneously. Exactly. As if looking at a picture, or as if describing a picture, how many which is how these ideas have frequently zero. been represented. How many recipes have you used up? The individual who acts in this equilibrated manner is the mythological hero. It's the mythological hero who confronts the attention, the unknown, with attention and intent to communicate. It's the archetypal hero who obtains the gold from the eternal dragon, the dragon of chaos. That's an evolved representation of the predatory but promising domain beyond the safety of the tree or the campfire. Manifesting serious. It's the archetypal hero who distributes the gold that he that he obtains from the dragon to the community. It's him who rescues the youthful virgin from the predatory reptile. That's Saint George. It's the oldest story we know. It's in the Enuma Elish, the Mesopotamian creation myth, upon which the opening lines of Genesis are found. Change the terminology. Can't you see an evolutionary relationship? I knew that. Because That's the archetype of your contagion. That's first a way of behavior. Second, it's a representation of that way of behavior. Third, it's a way of organizing society itself around that action and representation. Fourth, it's that society that then selects through masculine competition for the best contender to that representation. And finally, it's what is selected for by women who peel off the top of the masculine competition. Women 
government outsourced the impossible cognitive task of mate selection to the male dominance hierarchy. The hero emerges at the top of the competition. He gets all the girls. It's that which, it's that which is selected for. And he, human females, perform part of the selection process. Their mother nature, the selection apparatus, the cheesy maters, the female chimps are not. Creative people by definition are stable. The archetypal hero might be regarded as a super mean in Richard Dawkins' terminology. It's been around so long that we have adapted biologically to its existence. Just as we have adapted in every way to the presence of the 300 million year old dominance hierarchy, which is more permanent, more real even from a strictly realist perspective, than such evanescent phenomena as amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. It's even older than trees. Because the closer you are to that archetypal hero, the more likely you are, at least as a male, to win the dominance hierarchy contest that makes you attractive to women. If Richard Dawkins, who formulated the idea of the being, was wiser, he would have been Carl Jung. An archetype is the ultimate being. In my opinion, we need to have a real conversation, not an argument. It's not that I think you're wrong. It's that I think that there's a real problem here that we both recognize and are both trying to solve. If none of this makes even the least bit of sense, if it doesn't at least pique your curiosity, if you can't see that we're obsessed by the same problems, then we won't be able to talk, and that would be a shame. You're very sharp and precise, but I think in patterns. Somebody said listening to us was like the right hemisphere of a single brain talking to the left. That's a good metaphor. There wouldn't be so many people trying to get us to talk if we didn't have something to discuss. The relationship between science and ethics is vitally important. If we had a real conversation, and no fault is implied on your part, we might be able to further the solution to the problem. Too. And you have to be His like uh, sister was thanks for listening and, and watching friends. And you're not and they used to dress him up like a fairy so, princess. Dear Dr. Harris, for like years it happened. Please forgive me. He was and this goes for whatever audience this video might attract for reading this. So the gender roles there But I need to make this quick and coherent, and this is the fastest way of doing so. That's how you do it. I want you to address like some of the issues that I believe made our discussion both more trying and less valuable than it might have been. A problem that many of the people who now listen to it rightly identify. I think that our discussion would perhaps be more productive if we started from the realization that we're both trying to address the same problem. What is the relationship between science and ethics? You see ethics as nested inside scientific realism. Now obviously that's a contentious claim, which is not the same as it being wrong. But the fact that it's contentious, read David Hume and his problem with deriving an ought from an is, means that there is a real problem there. Good. I see scientific realism is nested inside Darwinian competition, at least potentially, not necessarily. I could be wrong, but I am trying to address the real problem. He's trying and to I think the fact that you're addressing the science slash ethics problem indicates that you see that there's a real problem there too. You play at it. I knew this guy. I also think we only got to the problems with my formulation, not the problems with your solution. For example, the problem with measuring well-being. You consider the enhancement of well-being the proper aim of ethics. However, just the psychological know, measures of well-being currently used are almost only trait extroversion minus trait neuroticism. That's happiness minus sadness. Well, that's how well-being is currently defined. Well, that proposition is faulty in every way. It's a big problem. It's a measurement problem. It's a scientific realism problem. You might say, well, we need better measures of well-being. And I would say, well, exactly. And those will have to be nested inside the Darwinian conundrum. How should we act in the world? First, you're a persona. Here's an answer. Individually, so that the family thrives, at the family level, so that society thrives, at the societal level, so that the ecosystem thrives. And not just today. Tomorrow, next week, next year, and across time. 
That's because that's the problem the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget was trying to address when he studied the moral development of children. Piaget was interested in solving the problem of the relationship between science and ethics, and he looked how he looked at how ethics in children emerged and transformed into adulthood. That's what drove his entire life. He was trying to formulate a scientific solution to the problem of ethics, and I've drawn a lot of my thinking from that. Now I'm going. I'm going to jump to a level of analysis, and when I do so, it will make many think I've gone off the rails in this argument. I ask for your indulgence while I try to put things together that have not yet been put together. This means that I have to present many ideas simultaneously, as if looking at a picture, or as if describing a picture, which is how these ideas are frequently represented. And they have a lot of fantasies of revenge. The individual who acts in this equilibrated manner and so is the mythological hero. It's, you have it's the mythological hero who confronts the attention, the unknown, with attention and intent to communicate. You've got some things it's the archetypal hero who obtains the gold from the eternal dragon, the dragon of chaos. That's an evolved representation of the predatory but promising domain beyond the safety of the tree or the campfire. It's dangerous. It's the archetypal hero who distributes the gold that he that he obtains from the dragon to the community. It's him who rescues the useful virgin from the predatory reptile. That's Saint George. It's the oldest story we know. It's in the Enuma Elish, the Mesopotamian creation head, upon which the opening lines of Genesis are found. Can't you see an evolutionary relationship? They're not saying what they have to say. That's the archetypal hero. That was part of it. That's first a way of behaving. Second, it's a representation of that way of behaving. Third, it's a way of organizing society itself around that action and representation. Fourth, it's that society that then selects through masculine competition for the best contender to that representation. And finally, it's what is selected for by women who peel off the top of the masculine competition. Women outsource the impossible cognitive task of mate selection to the male dominance hierarchy. The hero emerges at the top of the competition. He gets all the girls. It's that, what's, it's that which is selected for. And he, human females, perform part of the selection process. Their mother nature, the selection apparatus, the choosy neighbors that female chimps are not. The archetypal hero might be regarded as a super meme in Richard Dawkins' terms of achievements. It's been around so long that we have adapted biologically to its existence, just as we have adapted in every way to the presence of the 300 million year old dominance heart, which is more permanent, more real, even from a strictly realist perspective, than such evanescent phenomena as amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. It's even older than trees. The culture is dissolved. The closer you are to that archetypal hero, the more likely you are, at least as a male, to